What do you do? What do you do when you have that list of things you're crying out for and they're not answered? If you have some unanswered prayer, this scripture we're going to look at today is for you. And this sermon's for you. Turn with me in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I, I find it pretty amazing that in 82 nations today on Sunday, hundreds of thousands of every nation people are studying the exact same scripture we're studying right now. And over 80 nations and hundreds of thousands of people, and they'll be praying the same prayers we're praying and, and, and bringing this scripture before our eyes. We're a part of a big global family. Here it is, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong." This is the word of God. Paul is writing this famous, well-known passage. My grace is sufficient that's wrapped in this for a reason. How he gets there in the previous chapters, the Apostle Paul is defending his apostolic leadership and he's defending what he's been doing in ministry against some really unfair and untrue accusations and so he defends his ministry by recounting his preaching of the gospel he recounts his financial integrity he retells the story of enduring unjust intense persecution then he talks about his voluntary sacrifice and, and the, the voluntary suffering that he went through. And then he ends right where we read about the supernatural visions and revelations. And he goes to verse 7 after all of this in several chapters and he says, Now, to keep me from being conceited so I don't get prideful, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Now, there's a lot of speculation among Bible people and preachers about what exactly was the thorn. What was this messenger of Satan? Was it a disease? Was it a relational conflict? Was it, what was it? But Paul doesn't tell us, so to me it doesn't matter. I don't want to waste any time speculating of what it might have been. There's a lot of speculation about who gave him this thorn, this messenger from Satan. Was this a satanic thing? Was it from God? Was it from people? Was it his own lack of faith in bad confession? What, what, who did this to Paul? What was it? Who did it? No clue. Why was this thorn given? Ah, now there, he's clear about that. The why is answered. The source, no answer. The actual what is it, doesn't matter, but why? Why a thorn? And Paul clearly says it was given to keep me humble. So I wouldn't be conceited, so I wouldn't be prideful, so I wouldn't be arrogant, so I wouldn't move in pride. Every loving parent will do things to protect their children from things that are dangerous and harmful. God will do no less. And there's nothing more harmful to the soul of a follower of God than pride and arrogance and conceit. 
And God will go at great lengths to make sure we are free from pride and arrogance and all of that. And so whatever this thorn in the flesh was, whatever this messenger from Satan was, whatever was the source of the harassment in Paul's life, we get to verse 8 and he says three times, I pleaded with the Lord that this thing should leave me. Three times I not just asked, not once, but pleaded, implored, begged, passionately prayed to God that this would go away, whatever it is. You ever prayed for something and God didn't answer? Anybody? You ever prayed twice? Three times? 300 times? 3,000 times? Sometimes I've watched my grandchildren, when I say no, it doesn't really take much. They plead. They get real sweet. And I cave. Just cave in. I give them whatever they want. That's being a good grandfather. It's a calling. God's not like that. He didn't cave. He doesn't just, ah, okay. In 1990, when my oldest son was four, I noticed at bedtime, reading a story, praying for him, what looked like a bald spot. And over the next few months, I noticed different clumps of hair were falling out of his head. Within a year, his eyebrows were gone, his eyelashes were going, and his fingernails were, were messed up. We went to multiple doctors and different nations and got the same answer every time. We got the same diagnosis and the same answer. There's no known cause and no known cure for what your son has. It's actually something in the blood. It doesn't, it's not life and death. It only attacks the hair follicles and fingernails and toenails. But it comes and goes until adulthood and either the hair will all grow back or will be gone permanently. Now, you know, he didn't care. He was four. We have a loving home. We have a wonderful church. And so he was treated with love and respect and nobody paid any attention to it until a few years later when he went to school. I didn't know how bad it was for a while at school until one day he came home crying I think he was probably in first grade at the time, after kindergarten in first grade. And for some reason, he started pleading with my wife and I to homeschool him. He didn't want to ever get back on the bus and go to school again. And as we dug deeper, we found out things that people were doing to him and how cruel and mean-spirited people were about him having clumps of hair gone, and most of his hair being gone. It was before people really shaved their heads back in those days. It was a long time ago, and it wasn't really a thing. And um, you have to watch out for those Christian schools because there are a lot of mean kids in Christian schools, non-Christian schools also. But don't be deluded that because it's a Christian school that everybody's Christian-like. And it, it started a tough few years for us in praying for him, that God would heal him. Um, over and over and over and over. And, and I, I remember getting up early every day to build up enough faith in him to get back on that bus. Many times I would get off work early to go meet him at the bus stop, put him in my car, drive two blocks home, pray with him. We would, we would recount his day and things that people said and did, which was a daily occurrence of what we would call now bullying, but wasn't really called that then. And we would pray. I would lead him in prayers of forgiveness. I would teach him how to forgive people by name. I would teach him how to be bold and stand up for himself. I would teach him how I went to draw lines and what to do. And, and then the next morning, he wouldn't want to go to school again. And we would have to pray and encourage. And it was a battle for years. All the while, we prayed that God would heal him. What made it really tough was during that season, we had always prayed for healings in our church every Sunday. Sometimes during the musical part of worship, we would just stand up and say, if anyone needs prayer for healing, come up here while we worship God, and we would pray, and sometimes people got healed, sometimes they didn't. If we didn't pray then, then we would do it at the end of the sermon, right as the service was dismissing. We would say, if you want prayer for healing, come down and we'll pray for you. Every week we prayed for the sick. 
But there was this season where it seemed like healings were happening all the time. And this was one of those times in one of the darkest battles for the soul of my son who was in about third grade, maybe at the time, or fourth grade, I don't remember. Struggling with the hair thing. Not him, but the way people treated him because of it. And I'll never forget, I'd preached and we called people up, anyone who needs prayer for healing as we dismissed. And so somebody came with a headache and I'll go, okay, I can pray for that. And, you know, and I'm looking out of the corner of my eye and there's somebody waiting for me and I see that this child she's holding, about one year old, has one of her legs, is like a, I mean, I say a banana, but it's like a C, letter C. The other leg's straight, this other one is just deformed and curved. And I don't want to pray for this. I'm praying for the headache. But nobody else came up to pray. I finally ended this long prayer for the headache. And I went and said, what can I do? And she said, well, my son was born with a deformed leg and it's never going to be better. The doctors can't do anything and we want him to be able to walk. I prayed the most pitiful prayer that's ever been prayed at church. There was no faith. There was no life. There was nothing but my own resentment and doubt and unbelief about years of praying for my own son and God not answering my prayer. And I'm embarrassed to say how I prayed for this lady and her son. And then I went on to pray for someone else. Didn't think about it again. And next Sunday, that same lady comes running down before church. And she goes, look, in tears, sobbing. And that leg was perfectly straight. And she said that from Sunday, by about Wednesday, she noticed every day it started straightening out a little more and a little more. And by Sunday, she was just, and I should have been rejoicing, but I wasn't really. I was mad that how can I pray for someone else's child? And I pray for my own. And God answers that prayer. And it wasn't certainly because of my great prayer, because it was pitiful. But God, why won't you heal my son? Paul asked three times, and he got the message. This isn't really going to be answered. I didn't get the, I didn't get the memo. I prayed 3,000 times, and nothing was happening. You ever been like that? God doesn't seem to be listening. But you see other things happening, and so you know he's real. But in my world, I don't get it. But here's what happened. Paul says, three times I pleaded, God, do something. Verse 9, I don't like this verse, but it's the heart of the message. But he said to me, I do not like those but he said to me's. Because as soon as you see but, you know it's not going to turn out the way you wanted. God, I need this. But he said to me this. I don't know about you, there's been times when I've had my life planned out. But he said to me. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. But he said to me and erased everything I had lived for and prepared for and trained for. I had a wonderful life as a campus missionary at Mississippi State University. I love small towns. I was going to be the rest of my life to reach this campus with the gospel. And, but he said to me, go to the Philippines. So we went. I look back now, I am so glad, I am so see the hand of God, but at the time it was a, but he said to me. But you know what? After living there for over two decades, we loved our life there. But he said to me, go to Nashville. <sighs> no, I don't want to do that. How many of you have had some but he said to me's? Boy, you sure want that. But he said to me, and what did he say? My grace is, let me pause on that word right there, is, the shortest word there, my grace is, not will be, not might be, not future tense, not out there somewhere, my grace is, present tense, right now, my grace. No matter what your situation, no matter how painful, no matter how confusing, no matter how unjust, unfair, no matter how it doesn't seem to line up with what it should be, no matter what you're in, my grace is right now 
sufficient. I wish it had said abundant, but it didn't. I would rather have abundance. Sufficient means it's enough. Sometimes I feel like it's barely enough, but it's, do you have enough funds? Oh, I have abundance. Do you have enough funds? I have sufficient money. You know, there's a difference. But that's how God does it. My grace is present tense sufficient for whatever you're in the middle of. It helps to read the Bible and realize that you're not the only one who's had unanswered prayers. When I see that the Apostle Paul, I mean, we're talking the capital T, the Apostle Paul prayed three times and God didn't give him his answer. He asked for this and God said, but he said, my grace. I know sometimes we think that Pastor Billy or Pastor Norman or Pastor Paris or who's the pastor in this service, boy, God must answer their prayers. Probably not as much as he answers yours. That's the truth. He didn't even answer the Apostle Paul's. Christmas time with my six-year-old granddaughter, we had, a interesting, we had an interesting time. Got my grandkids there, and my two grandsons, who were three and two, they got these big old Paw Patrol things. Okay, anybody know Paw Patrol? I know them all by first name. We're all buddies. <laughs> these big things, and so, and then by my granddaughter, the six-year-old, her gift was like this big. It was, it was a small thing, and so she was already upset, because bigger is better, Right? especially Christmas. I should have put it in a big box. So they opened their things, and then hers was a gift card. She was just crushed. She tried to act thankful because her parents trained her to do that, but you could tell. But we tried to explain the power of a gift card. She did not understand it. We told her, Tomorrow we will take you, not your, not these other people, you. We will go spend this. It didn't help. She had asked for this, but she got this. Paul had asked for deliverance, but he got grace to endure what he wanted to be delivered of. Oh, God, no. I don't want a grace card. I want deliverance. Do you know what happened? Something miraculous happened the day after Christmas when my wife and I took our disappointed granddaughter who did not get what she wanted. When we took her to spend that gift card, now it helped that my wife let her put anything in the cart she wanted. I think we tripled the amount on the gift card. I'm going, <laughs> no, no, this is not... Uh. All she wants for every Christmas birthday from now on is a gift card. <laughs> when you do not get what you think you need and deserve and what you prayed and fasted for and God gives you something else instead, at some point in your life, you're going to realize that was better. Now, it was the next day for my granddaughter. It took a long time for me with the battle with my son's hair issue. Long time. A lot of heart issues. You know, I think about others in the Bible who didn't get their prayers answered. I love the attitude of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember those guys in Daniel? If you haven't, read it later, the book of Daniel. The king says, from now on, idolatry is the new religion. If you don't bow down to the statues that look like me, bow down to the statues, then we will throw you, burn you alive in the fiery furnace. And so three guys didn't bow down, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the king is going, look, you're gonna, I'm going to throw you in the fire. I'm going to burn you alive. And here's what they said. Our God can deliver us. Ah, love the faith confession. They said, but... Even if he does not, we still won't serve you. Our God can do it, but if he doesn't, we'll serve you in it. You know what a lot of us do? We say, God, if you do this, I'll serve you like this. You know what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did? They said, God, we would love for you to do this, but even if you don't, we will serve you anyway. 
are you a even if he doesn't or only if he does kind of Christian? There are too many only if he does. I will serve God if he does what I want him to do. If he answers my prayers, if he blesses me in this way, if he comes through in here, then I will serve him. That is not what Christianity is. Christianity is, God, I sure want you to do this, but even if you don't, you are God and I will serve you anyway with all of my heart. I may do it with a broken heart, but I will do it. I will serve you anyway. I told you about my friend who's preaching today. When he signed those papers, tears soaking the paper. Less than two weeks later, we buried his wife. He served God anyway. He's preaching the gospel today at one of our sites. He was like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God, please heal my wife. But even if you don't, I will serve you anyway. The problem is, here's what we think. When God doesn't answer our prayers, we think something's wrong with us. We start thinking, God probably doesn't love me as much as he loves someone else. Let me give you one other story, and I'm going to end with this. In the Bible, there was another person who prayed exactly like Paul did three times. Three times. God didn't answer his prayer. In Matthew 26, this other guy, his name is Jesus. It's the Garden of Gethsemane right before he's going to the cross. You can look it up later, Matthew 26. And uh, what is the verse? Where is that? Matthew 26 and verse 39. It says, Jesus goes off to pray. And he says, Father, I don't want to do this. If you can take this cup from me, meaning the cross, then please do it. But not my will, your will be done. Then he went and got his people who were supposed to pray with him, the disciples, but they were asleep. He wakes them up and it says he goes back a second time. And he says, God, please don't make me do this, but whatever you want. And then it says he comes a third time in verse 44. Jesus prayed just like Paul three times. And you know what? The father did not answer his prayer. Do you think that means the father didn't love the son? Do you think that because the Jesus' prayer that he prayed three times was not answered, do you really think that means that he was somehow disobedient, therefore his prayer wasn't answered, that he was somehow not pleasing to his father, therefore, do you think that's what that means? Do you think that Paul's prayer wasn't answered, does that mean God didn't love him? What Jesus said was, here's what I'm praying, but... Ultimately, not my will, but your will be done. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, God, you can do it, but even if you don't, we're still serving you. I want you to end, I want to end with this thought. God's grace is sufficient for you, even when your will and his will are different. When you want this, but God gives you this. When you want that, but God gives you something else, His grace is sufficient. Number two, God's love is constant. When you leave here and you look at your list of answered prayers and your ten times longer list of unanswered prayers, don't conclude that God doesn't love you. When you're in the middle of one of those multi-year battles of prayer and faith and it doesn't seem to be working, I'm pleading with you, don't come to the conclusion that something must be wrong with me. God must not love me because that's just not true. God's love is constant even when he doesn't answer your prayers. And the third thing I want to leave you with is, please continue to seek his face especially when he doesn't answer your prayers. What do you do when God doesn't answer your prayers? Hang on to his grace. Seek his face. Don't conclude wrongly that he doesn't love you. At some point, you're going to see and understand why. It might be a week. It might be 10 years from now. But at some point, you'll look back. And you know what? you will thank God for those unanswered prayers. 
one day you will. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the answers to prayer, and we thank you in advance for the unanswers because we believe in your infinite wisdom and your sacrificial love. In Jesus' name, amen.